So, of course, <laughs> it's a great honor to uh, be invited to talk at the 60th birthday. I must say, I find it very difficult to believe that Lewis is 60. <laughs> I also understand quite clearly why I'm put on last, because against the graybeards, Lewis, as he is actually, is forever young. So, <laughs> to me, he's still a kid. <laughs> um, let's go back to the first time that I met Lewis. He came to Oxford uh, when he was 27, and uh, I asked him to send me a photograph of those times, and he sent, uh, he sent this photograph here. Now, I think the thing that you should look at closely is just how many books are in front of him. Uh, he's obviously a very studious uh, <laughs> young postdoc. And in fact, uh, Paco came at the same time, and, uh, and since after that we had a golden era, oh, starting with that, we had a golden era of uh, post postdocs and visitors coming from, from Spain, and it's been, it's been great having uh, that happen. So, what about Lewis and Susie? Well, when, uh, when Lewis came to Oxford, he uh, had been working on grand unified theories and uh, brought that expertise to us. Uh, you can see a couple of papers that were written in Oxford, one with Paco on SO10. And uh, so that was a good start. But the start of SUSE, I remember, was in May 1981. There was a Royal Society meeting in London that we all uh, went down to. And Demopoulos talked about supersymmetric unification. And uh, we got intrigued by this and uh, started working on it. And in July, uh, we wrote this paper on low energy predictions and supersymmetric grand unified theories, which basically pointed out uh, that uh, you, uh, oh, I don't know why that happens. It's off. I thought there was a pointer somewhere. Oh, that's up here, is it? Where is the pointer? Anyway. Um, that's the, that's the thing, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, we pointed out uh, that uh, there was a break in the slope of the running couplings uh, that brought them together at, uh, at a scale of around 10 to the 15. Now, actually, this slide I I is not the one that the we would have shown at the time. Uh, it, there had already been a paper by uh, Demopoulos, Wilczek, and Rabi in which they had uh, looked at the evolution of the gauge couplings and concluded that uh, it would come uh, with the same prediction as SU5, which at the time was rather good because uh, at that time the parameters were such that SU5 had a nice uh, gauge unification and SUSE was well off. However, uh, I think we were the first to, to point out that you needed to have two Higgs doublets in order to make sense of the theory and that then changed the prediction to the one that we now know uh, works rather well in, in, uh, in the simplest MSSM type theories. So that was one uh, uh, early paper on SUSE that I think was quite interesting. Uh, then subsequently we wrote the paper on, on uh, su uh, symmetry breaking in which, uh, as you can see from this slide here, uh, radiative corrections can drive the Higgs uh, mass squared negative, triggering, super, uh, triggering a standard model uh, SU2 breaking uh, in a rather natural way because uh, uh, the squawks uh, having QCD interactions don't go negative. It's the ones that don't have the uh, uh, QCD interaction that go negative, explaining why it's SU2 rather than SU3 that's broken. Now, of course, all of these things are so well known now that it's rather difficult to remember uh, uh, the significance of these, but at the time uh, there was a big problem in, in building supersymmetric theories because of the, the fact that if you broke it without uh, radiative corrections, you would split uh, the, the squawks on either side, one lighter than the quark, one heavier, and that of course is incompatible. In, in and here at least one can see that uh, radiative effects could generate viable uh, SUSE models. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Uh, Lewis wrote, I looked up, uh, I looked up uh, his publication record and saw at least 40 papers said had supersymmetry in the titles, but uh, 
Of course, essentially all his papers rely on supersymmetry at some stage or other, almost all of them anyway. Uh, so Susie has been very important to him. But the question is, Susie at 39, where is she? She's uh, getting rather old and uh, still no sign. And so uh, <coughs> is, is she overdue is one question. Well, the, the only reason that we have to think that supersymmetry should be a low energy uh, 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 symmetry, one accessible at the LHC, is the hierarchy problem. And to qu try and quantify the hierarchy problem, uh, there's a fine tuning measure. Now, um, this is the, uh, the type of fine tuning measure that Ellis and company and Barbieri Giudici introduced some years ago. Here, I'd just like to say that if you treat uh, the W mass as an observable quantity uh, and then uh, do a normal likelihood uh, analysis, you actually have to take the fine tuning measure seriously because it comes out automatically that then you have in the likelihood of 1 over this uh, fine tuning measure. And so you can give a, a, a probabilistic interpretation to the fine tuning that would say that if the fine tuning gets, say, much larger than 50 to 100, uh, it would be statistically unacceptable. Uh, so that, uh, at least, is my motivation for asking, have we, uh, has LHC now been able to say we've, Susie was a good idea for solving the hierarchy problem, but we've now exhausted all of its possibilities. If that's not the case, perhaps it's pointing in the definite direction for what Susie signals we should be looking for. So using that, let's apply this fine tuning measure to the simple model of the CEMS SSM in which the uh, Susie parameters are, are shown here and look at the fine tuning with respect to these parameters. Uh, before the LHC started up, the situation is as shown in this uh, diagram here. If you plot the fine tuning versus the Higgs mass, it has some structure and actually had a minimum just above uh, the uh, let bound for the Higgs. Now, in this, the let mass wasn't put in. Uh, the position of that bound was actually coming from the, the non observation of the supersymmetric particles, giving you a, a lower threshold for them. So, one could say that the most likely place for LHC to find the Higgs was at uh, roughly 114, 115. GeV. Moreover, you could ask what the dark matter uh, abundance would be, and in the dark colored areas, it would be within three sigma of the W map uh, type <coughs> limit. And you can ask what the fine tuning would be expected at this minimum, and it's of the order of uh, 18 if you include the dark matter constraints. So that's not, uh, to my mind, particularly fine tuned, and uh, one could still expect to see uh, Susie turn up at uh, the LHC. There's actually some structure here. You'll notice uh, that there's a sharp rise here and that the fine tuning uh, is sitting uh, just at, this, the, at the point that the, 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 the arrow is shown here. This, along this line, uh, you're sitting close to the focus point where if you have some connection between the soft SUSY breaking parameters, in this case, equality of the uh, Higgs and top stop and uh, stop left and stop right mass soft masses, then there's a cancellation in uh, the renormalization group equations that means that you're effectively in de it, uh, you're not dependent on the value of m zero in determining the mass of the Higgs. Um, so you're insensitive to m zero. You can make m zero much uh, greater, and that then says that uh, the fact you hadn't discovered uh, things at high scales was not perhaps so surprising. So when is the fine tuning for this problem? For okay, so uh, for me, in this probabilistic sense, uh, fine tuning of 100 is already uh, really uh, ruled out. So I would like to study uh, theories for which uh, uh, the fine tuning is less than or equal to 100. Now, what happened after LHC? Well, the direct SUSY searches uh, have, and now I've changed uh, to uh, uh, a graph in which I've got m one half and m0, uh, the Gagino common mass and the scalar common mass. Uh, the various points that I showed uh, on this diagram, uh, color-coded, 
Uh, the only ones that haven't been ruled out by the direct searches are those that are lying along this line where you're close to the focus point. Um, it turns out that in this region, uh, the LSP has a significant hexeno component, which means that it's uh, sensitive to direct uh, spin-independent searches. And that, uh, if you accept the estimates for local uh, dark matter density uh, has already been ruled out by xenon. So there's a sort of complementarity going on. But more than that, uh, you see in here that it's actually the me measurement of the Higgs mass that has produced the most serious problem because the Higgs mass at 125 takes you well away from the 114 that was a favored value and puts you into the high fine-tuned region of over 300. And the reason for that is that to get the Higgs mass heavy enough, you need to have the stops uh, contributing uh, significantly to the Higgs mass, uh, and that this is forcing the stops to be above some 900 GeV or so. So the MSSM um, is essentially, in, in with the, cr the criterion that I have for the fine tuning, uh, is essentially ruled out uh, already. Which brings you then to say, well, does that mean that there's no hope for Susie and it's already been tested? I think uh, uh, Guido was uh, casting uh, uh, that sort of opinion. Uh, let me address that opinion then. Reducing fine tuning, well, uh, perhaps the MSSM is not the way that Susie is implemented. Perhaps there's more to it. And you can actually study that in a, in a uh, model independent way. Uh, by using a general operator analysis. So you take the MSSM and then you add, uh, here's the leading dimension five operator, so there's only one of them, um, with a scale M star that uh, you, allow, you see is, uh, is above the uh, Susie, uh, Susie breaking scale. You add this and see how sensitive your fine tuning is to that. And uh, if, if it is sensitive to it, you're then saying that uh, uh, departures from the MSSM may be rather significant. And what we found, well, it turns out that this operator generates two types of term. In the, uh, in the Higgs potential, it gives you an H1 cubed H2 type term, which is with this coefficient C1, and an H1 H2 squared term C2. Now, both of these terms contribute to the Higgs mass, but this one contributes more, in, at least in the low uh, tangent beta re regime. And uh, so what we found was that the fine tuning, and this is a rather uh, rough graph compared with the previous ones, uh, is reduced because effectively you're shifting this rise uh, by 10 to 20 GeV uh, to the right. So then you can accommodate a much heavier Higgs without paying the penalty that I showed before. So that's the uh, general structure. You can ask then what in particular could generate that. Uh, one way you can generate this is to say, let's have a, a, an additional singlet in the theory, a singlet extension of the MSSM, and uh, that's been widely studied in the past, the NMSSM, uh, with the superpotential given here, which uh, had the advantage of generating the mu term through a spontaneous breaking in which this singlet field gets a verb at the same time as the electroweak symmetry is being broken. But it turns out that this doesn't generate that leading operator, the H1 cubed H2 term. The way you can generate that operator is if you allow also a mass term for the singlet uh, and uh, an explicit mu term. So effectively, what you're saying is I'll put back some dimensionful terms in the superpotential. I call this a general next to minimal supersymmetric standard model. And in the case that the mass of the singlet is, is much heavier than the SUSY breaking scale, you can integrate it out. And what you find is that on integrating it out, you get exactly uh, the operator. Uh, uh, you get exactly the uh, terms in the potential H up cubed H down uh, that I said gave you the most significant effect. Of course, there's a problem to that, and that is that uh, Introducing explicit mass terms seems to reintroduce the, the hierarchy problem. What forces them to, to be small? Uh, well, it, uh, uh, Peter already 
alluded to the existence of an R symmetry in his models. And here, a discrete R symmetry plays uh, an important role in the sense that uh, you can arrange uh, to have the uh, theory to be invariant under a discrete R symmetry. And while that discrete R symmetry is exact, and here I'm illustrating it with n equals 4 and n equals 8 discrete symmetries, um, you kill these mass terms. So you start with something that actually looks just like the NMSSM. And incidentally, at the same time, you kill the dimension five uh, proton decay operator, QQQL, uh, that is allowed in the normal matter parity uh, of the MSSM. And it's a bit of an embarrassment because the coefficient in here should have an effective mass scale some 10 to the 7 times the Planck mass. Here, the R symmetry does that uh, rather uh, immediately. Um, also, the, the uh, Z4 case uh, has uh, the unique property that it commutes with SO10, making it very much easier to uh, use this uh, extra symmetry in a grand unified sense. Now, in SUSY breaking, as again Peter uh, mentioned before, uh, you automatically generate new terms. Uh, Kazas and Munoz pointed this out some time ago. And uh, we use that uh, to say that when you break supersymmetry, as you must do, uh, the superpotential gets a verb, but it carries R charge of 2. So it breaks the Z4 down to Z2. You still have a residual exact uh, Z2 matter parity. Uh, and it generates these mass terms. So these mass terms are of the right order, uh, the Susie breaking scale, uh, to do uh, what I showed you on the previous transparency to alleviate the fine tuning problem. Uh, and they're actually uh, domain wall and tadpole safe, which is one of the problems you should worry about. So what about the phenomenology of this? Uh, has it been tested yet? Well, in the first uh, uh, figure here, what I'm showing is the constrained MSSM in this gold type color, uh, the constrained next to minimal supersymmetric model with some red points. There are a few isolated ones out here, but it's quite hard to get up to the 125 GV Higgs. And you see that the general version indeed uh, allows you to get easily up to the 125 GV Higgs with a fine tuning something between 20 and 30. So still regions that uh, need to be tested. If you add dark matter constraints, uh, that fine tuning goes up a little bit, but there are still significant number of points uh, that are, are relatively lowly fine tuned. Uh, the density of these points shouldn't be taken as indicative of something special going on. It's just that we searched rather harder to find ones in the right region. Um, now the, the dark matter it, uh, uh, direct searches are ineffective in this case because the LSP uh, has no significant hexeno component and its uh, cross-section is, is some two orders of magnitude below that that's currently probed by xenon. It would require the one ton xenon in order to do it. Um, in fact, it's, it's star core annihilation that reduces the dark matter density. And now you see a problem because the star core annihilation density uh, this is M0 and M1 half plane, it runs out at relatively low values of M0 and M1 half, which corresponds to relatively low masses for the SUSY particles. And with the latest uh, non-observation of SUSY at LHC, uh, essentially even this model has been tested uh, in the low fine-tuned region, which is the region with delta less than 100 by my def definition. So should we give up now? Uh, well, uh, you can ask, are there any other ways to reduce fine tuning? And one other way that has been explored is uh, to have non-universal gauge genome masses because in the renormalization group equations, there can then be a cancellation between the contr direct contribution uh, from the Wino and uh, uh, the Bino, these last two terms, which are negative, with the contribution from the squawks, but the squawks are getting the, uh, a significant contribution uh, 
from the Gluino. So it's a, it's a two-loop uh, one against a, a one-loop one. And what you find is that um, this cancellation works rather well if M2 and M3 are rather close at low scales in mass. Now, of course, uh, if you've unified gauge genome masses at a very high scale, then everything I'm talking about here assumes you've got gauge coupling unification going up to uh, some 10 to the 16, 10 to 17 GeV. So everything is, is being run down. The, the uh, gluinos become some three times or more heavier than the wieners at low scales. So in order to... Yeah. This coincidence is not appreciated itself? Well, I'll come to that. It's just on the next part of the transparency. You need to read faster. <laughs> um, so in this dark shaded region, if you, lie, if you lie here, and what's being plotted, A to 1 and A to 3 are the ratios of M1 to M2 and M3 to M2. If these ratios at the, at the high scale should be in this region, uh, then you will access this, this uh, reduction in fine tuning. Now, of course, the point being made is that uh, uh, you don't, can't put that in by hand. Are there any theories that give you that? Well, here, for example, in a grand unified sense, if the field that is giving you gay genome masses, that, whose F term is giving gay genome masses, should not be an SU5 singlet, in which case you've got the usual one to one to one, but for example, transformed as a SU75, uh, the initial values for M1 to M2, uh, M3 to M2 would be one to three. So when you have the QCD running, they, it, it undoes that one to three and it becomes essentially equal at the, at the low scale. So that would be one example of how you would get it naturally. Uh, there's another example that we uh, were rather uh, keen on, uh, which was an Oberfold model that Lewis had, uh, had written down previously, uh, in which the ratios are determined uh, by the value of the Green-Schwartz term. And since that's quant quantized, Choosing a definite value is not fine-tuning, uh, and with a choice that actually Lewis had, had wanted uh, of, of minus five, uh, it gave you exactly the same result. So there are ways to do it. And Peter also has, uh, in his uh, uh, Mirage uh, mediation, has a similar structure that appears for uh, the initial values of the gauge genome masses. So what happens in this case? If you have the GNM SSM plus non-universal gauge median masses, uh, have we tested this? Well, it turns out, uh, well, uh, we have, we're, we're only just uh, getting into some detail with this. So this is preliminary work, but uh, uh, what's being shown here essentially are the ratios A to uh, 3 and A to 1, uh, written slightly differently. But the ratios that uh, I was advertising before would have had uh, this quantity B equal to 3 and A would be somewhere up here. And you see, this is the fine-tuning versus this quantity, and it has a minimum. It actually drops at three, but it slightly prefers four. So, uh, so maybe uh, uh, you would have to have a model that would give you, uh, if you want to actually get that, would give you the four. Um, the, the Oberfold model I talked about in the 75 would give you the three. Uh, you do reduce fine-tuning as expected, uh, there's not so much sensitivity to the mass, uh, the, the ratio of M1 to M2. It doesn't play such an important role. So th it's really the ratio of M3 to M2 that's significant. Uh, in here, this plotted here is the value for mu s, which is the singlet mass that you have to put in. And you'll see, it, or you probably won't see, uh, that the scale is such that mu s starts around uh, 3 TeV, uh, and many of the points are much greater than that. And what this is saying is that even if the scale of the singlet should be 5 TeV, it reduces the fine tuning significantly. And why is that? It's because the change in the Higgs mass um, has the scale sitting in the denominator and uh, the terms in the numerator are large so that even if, if you can accommodate a, a, a 5 TeV here quite readily, even with lambda in the perturbative uh, regime. Lambda is a, is a coupling S, uh, H up, H down. And now, uh, how does it change from what went before? Well, what it changes in the sense that the nature of the LSP becomes uh, different. You can have significant Wino and Bino components, which mean um, that 
rather than uh, star core annihilation running out, you have a more efficient way of reducing the uh, dark matter abundance below uh, the uh, W map bounds as you need to do. And in fact, this whole picture has rather uh, uh, specific properties which say where you should look for Susie. Uh, the gate genome focus point says that the gluino and wino masses should be rather similar. Dark ma matter abundance uh, below uh, what's wrongly called overclosure requires that the LSP should have a significant Wiener or Wiener component, which means the LSP uh, mass should be relatively close to the Wiener and hence the Gluino. Um, the latest LHC Gluino mass bounds require the LS for, uh, and LSP of the order, the Gluino, says the mass of the LSP had better be heavy, six to 700 GeV. The non-detection of dark matter requires that the Higgsino should be uh, much heavier than that because otherwise you would get direct uh, annihilation as, I, as you find for the MSSM. Um, and that then requires that the effective mu term should be about bigger than 700 GeV. And um, well, the net effect of all of this is you get a compressed spectrum. Uh, and uh, that may be what we should be looking for. So let me just summarize uh, this. Uh, I've been arguing that the fine-tuning problem is the one reason that we should expect to have SUSY uh, visible at the LHC. It's important in my mind to make sure that we don't miss out on any of the, that, that region before saying SUSY is dead. And I've been arguing uh, that there's still room for low fine-tuned SUSY. It's certainly being squeezed, uh, but it's not yet dead. And uh, in order to to close that, you will need uh, LHC 14. Uh, indirect hints. Well, indirect hints are uh, for Susie are G minus uh, 2. Gamma gamma has sort of disappearing, as is Fermi. It must be said that indirect hints are not doing too well for Susie, apart from the fact that G minus 2 remains resolutely three sigma away from the standard model. But um, that would require uh, light sleptons. So you'd have to split the degeneracy between the swarps and sleptons. Compressed SUSY, of course, has an interesting thing that it makes it more difficult to find uh, uh, and uh, the LHC searches are less efficient and that's something that uh, is worth studying. Um, actually, there's another, another last part to the summary. This LHC has given us some really interesting information about the Higgs, in particular that it's 125 GeV. Uh, and uh, what are the implications of that? Well, that takes me on to Lewis and Susie in 2013. He's still going strong. Um, this intriguing property I was talking about is that if you look at the quartic coupling and evolve it just in the standard model, uh, the quartic coupling uh, is, uh, is going towards zero. It actually uh, crosses zero um, if you take the central values for the top mass, basically. Uh, uh, of course, there's been a lot of interest in that because if it goes negative, uh, you, 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 you have a false minimum out the Planck scale, but uh, you can establish that the lifetime of the universe uh, is uh, shorter than the decay lifetime. So this is still viable. Um, so then the question is, uh, how do you explain lambda going uh, small? And uh, in, in SUSY, uh, you have a connection to, uh, of lambda to the gauge couplings and, uh, and the value of uh, cos 2 beta, which if you want lambda to go to zero, it, you'd prefer to have cos 2 beta vanish, tan beta equals one. Perhaps a ship's symmetry is involved. Um, now, Lewis has been very active in, in suggesting SUSY, well, He's, they're still exploring the possibility it should be low, uh, in which case there are uh, new, new relations he's coming up with which perhaps can alleviate the fine-tuning problem. Let me just emphasize that I was looking at specific ways of reducing the fine-tuning problem by having some connection uh, between the SUSY breaking parameters, uh, and that seemed to help. It's, it's clear that if the underlying theory had the very special uh, connection, it could uh, ultimately help a lot better. So 
it's uh, the exploration of models which give you interesting connections between uh, fine uh, Susy breaking parameters that hitherto were unconnected are good. As far as I'm aware, this model uh, is still fine-tuned, um, but it it's does suggest that there's more work that could be done to see if there's a pattern of, of soft masses that could do even better than I was able to show. Or perhaps the, uh, the Susie is at the... At an int oh, there, what happened there? <laughs> I didn't touch anything. <laughs> no, not that one. <laughs> Just put there, yeah. Um, I'm scared to touch anything now. Uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps it's at the intermediate scale, and uh, you, 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 you explain the value of lambda being zero through um, uh, perhaps a shift symmetry that would force cos uh, squared 2 beta to, to vanish. Um, or maybe you even put it up at the Planck scale, and it's intriguing that at the Planck scale, uh, if you change the top mass, reduce the top mass to sigma from its current best value, then lambda just vanishes at the Planck scale. So maybe nature is trying to teach us something there. And another interesting thing is that the beta function for lambda in this case also vanishes at the Planck scale. Now maybe this is a pure coincidence, uh, but maybe nature is trying to teach us something. I know of no explanation which uh, has been proposed for having beta lambda vanish at, uh, at the Planck scale, uh, so maybe it's just accidental. Anyway, uh, what's clear is beyond the standard models still to come. Whatever it is, Lewis will be at the thick of it, I'm sure. So I'd like to close by thanking you, Lewis. It's been a lot of fun. That, the reason for that is I wanted to maintain uh, gauge coupling unification. If you don't, if you don't require uh, uh, physics going up to the uh, gr uh, gut scale, then the fine-tuning problem gets much uh, easier because it's the large log that is making the fine-tuning as, as severe as it is. So if you just put Susie at uh, uh, 10 TeV or something like that, the the, the, there is loads, loads of room for Susie in, as far as fine-tuning is concerned. And from that point of view, uh, you know, I don't think uh, choosing lambda bigger than uh, 0.7 uh, saves any more than that general comment because the moment it becomes non-perturbative, I think you have to worry about uh, uh, whether it, it, it grand unifies or anything like that. You just don't know what's happening there. Okay, um, what we did both actually. Um, in the original color slides I showed you that there was dark colors and light colors. The dark colors were the whole dark matter, the light colors was just lower bound. And uh, when we did the GNMSSM values, we would first look for points that were just less than or equal to the bound, and then we check whether there were points that actually s saturated the bound. Another question? Yeah, I, I yeah. didn't understand really well why you said that if you reduce to the sigma something, then you, you get the uh, plot for lambda? Or the, or the yes. So, so you see the width, the width of the, that curve on the left-hand side. Yes. The dominant source of the width is the uncertainty in the top mass, which affects the evolution of the couplings because the top Yukawa coupling changes, all right? And, uh, and What's done here is to choose the top mass to be 171 instead of 173 or so, and then all of the couplings come together. So it obviously is of great interest to determine the, 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 the top mass. Now, it turns out that's not something that's going to happen quickly, and uh, probably you, we will need uh, new techniques to, to try and measure uh, uh, the top mass, uh, such as the transverse mass techniques, etc., that were explored for 
for uh, non suzy particles as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's another uncertainty that I don't think has been properly. Uh, I, I think it's the MS bar that's used here, but I don't know that you can justify it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, since I'm the last uh, speaker, I would just like to record my thanks and I presume your thanks uh, to Pablo, Fernando and Angel for organizing such a nice meeting and something that honors Lewis in an appropriate way. Uh, to Roxanda for looking after us uh, so well and uh, looking after the photography and the sound, Monica and Andre. So I'm going to ask you to thank them. Some uh, thanks to give to many people. Thanks to many people who have come from different places in Europe and even in America here. Thank you for coming to this fest. Uh, thanks again to the organizers, my ex students, uh, <coughs> Fernando Marchesano, Pablo Camara, and Angel Uranga. Uh, thank you very much, and also for not asking me whether I wanted or not. <laughs> you just <laughs> they just told me at the beginning of February, here it is. These are the speakers, so, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, and then coming back in time, I would like to thank uh, uh, my early mentors, uh, Jose Luis Sanchez Gomez and Ramon Fernandez Alvarez Estrada, who gave me the opportunity uh, to start a scientific career. And uh, uh, also were very important for me, my early colleagues uh, in this business, uh, Tony Gonzalez Arroyo, Carmen Albajar, Heli Hernandez Bos Mediano, who are around, and many others, like Cesar Gomez, and plenty of others. <coughs> it was very important that if we were a group of friends and colleagues uh, working hard in those times, which were not that easy. And uh, uh, of course, uh, my collaborators at the different stages, my collaborators in Oxford, Graham, Paco, and several others, my collaborators at CERN. Uh, Peter Niles, uh, Jean-Pierre Derendinger, Fernando Quevedo, Ana Maria, Dito Lust, uh, uh, and also friends there, Luis Alvarez Gome, uh, Alvaro de Rujula, many, many friends over there. And uh, of course, uh, uh, my colleagues and collaborators here in the Universidad Autónoma and the Institute and outside these institutions. Uh, uh, finally, <coughs> last but not least, uh, uh, to Carmen, for many, many, many reasons. Okay. So thank you all again, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, so, hello? Yeah. Before you leave, this is not totally over. Some of us are uh, joining some dinner tonight, and I just want to tell that you have uh, two comma three options for going there. One of them is meeting you there, guys, at nine. Maison Posada de la Villa, another one uh, leaving from here uh, quarter to eight, going directly to the place. And if some of you who are staying in Gran Villa want me to pick them up at 8.30 from there at the lobby, just let me know and I'll be there, okay? So see you, see you later. It's not, it's not far, it's walking distance. <laughs> <laughs>